An old legend from India about the origins of chess tells the story that more than 1,000 years ago, an inventor created chess for his king. Being very pleased, the king offered a reward. Let us look at the inventor's request. He said, just give me grains of wheat upon each square of the chessboard, such that one grain is placed on the first square, two on the second, four on the third, and so on, doubling the number of grains on each subsequent square. Let's look at this more carefully. So he wanted one grain to be placed here, two grains here, four here, and so on. So let's write eight, 16, 32, and so on, 64, 128, until at the very end you would have noticed that this is just two to the power of zero, two, two to the power of two, two to the power of three, and so on. And this one would be, since we're, we're starting with two to the power of zero, this one would be two to the power of 63. This would be equal to one plus two plus two squared plus two cubed and so on, plus two to the power of 63, which is equal to two to the power of 64 minus one. When the king realized that the inventor had tricked him and that there was not enough uh, wheat in the entire kingdom to give the, to the inventor, the king ordered the inventor killed. Now, let us take a closer look at why at this computation that we just made. Why is it that one plus two plus two squared plus two cubed and so on plus two to the power of 63 is equal to two to the power of 64 minus one? It's a, it's a very simple trick that we're gonna use. Basically, we know that if we have an amount, we can double that amount and then take away the original amount. So we're gonna use that very simple trick. So we have this amount well, let's just write it like this, 2 to the power of 0 plus 2 plus 2 squared and so on. What we're going to do is, we're first going to multiply this by 2, that amount. And then... Let's, let's write 62 here, and then power of 63, and then we have to subtract the original amount, which is 2 to the power of 0 minus 2, uh, minus, uh, and so on, minus, uh, no, because we're, we are subtracting all those quantities, that's correct, but we are here. We're inside this parenthesis. So this is 2 to the 63rd power. So when you do this, you end up with this. When you carry out that multiplication. And now you're going to take away this. And notice that you're subtracting those terms. So this is going to cancel with this one, these two cancel out, these two cancel out, and so on, and these two cancel out. And we are left with only these two terms, 2 to the, 60, two to the power of 64 minus 1. Thank you. Let us see what happens when we graph y equals 2 to the x. Incidentally, I am using the Desmos calculator. You find it at desmos.com. I really like this, this uh, application. Um, it, it, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's not like the, that clumsy TI-81, 82, 83. Uh, no, this is, this is very nice, and you can play with the uh, 
you see with the scale very nice and easy uh, especially if you have a touch screen uh, computer but okay so, so let's look at that so we have that function and what happens when we change the base and we consider say y equals instead of 2 say 3 to the x 3 to the x oh we get a function that just increases at a faster rate but it has the same general shape and what if instead of 3 we go up a bit higher uh, like y equals 10 to the x oh look at that how sharply now it goes it goes all the way up now what if we were to uh, look I'm gonna keep uh, y equals 2 to the x and now I'm gonna play a little bit with it what if we were to uh, instead of a base uh, greater than 1 we would choose a base between 0 and 1 let's choose 1 half y equals say 1 half to the x Oh, notice, notice what happens. We get a function, we get a function that is uh, a mirror reflection along the y-axis. This is very neat. This is very neat. And it, it, it all makes sense, right? Because when x is equal to, say, uh, uh, they intersect at x equals 0 because both are 1. But and when x equals one, two, uh, one, the the red one is one, two, and the purple one is one half. And as you move along to to uh, the red one, two to the fifth power, that's uh, uh, thirty two. So when x is five, uh, y is thirty two, and the purple one, when x is uh, five, y is one over thirty. Uh, one over thirty two. Uh, because the number just uh, becomes smaller and smaller. But notice that if we have, uh, instead of 5, negative 5, 1 half to the negative 5, then that becomes uh, the, the reciprocal of that. So it, it will become uh, 32 as well. Uh, and you see it on the left-hand side of the purple screen. Now, another nice thing that we may want to do using this uh, calculator, this the de decimals graphing calculator, is and what happens if I instead of this I, I multiply by say negative two. So what would happen? Well, say y equals say negative two to the x. Uh, now I am not I'm not saying that the base is negative. Okay, let me clarify that. All I am saying, I'm taking the opposite of that, okay? I'm taking the opposite of that, and that is why we get a reflection along the x-axis. As we discussed, we will see it in a, in, a, uh, in a separate video, why it is that we don't consider negative bases. But we can see that uh, we, we get that, and looking at the, the red one, what happens when we, say, multiply it by, a say, a factor of, y equals, say, 5 times 2 to the x, 2 to the x. What do we get? Oh, isn't that nice? Uh, we get, we get, that's the black uh, graph. We get a graph that it, it just grows uh, at a faster uh, rate than, than the red one. One question that many students uh, ask is, why is the growth or the decay factor in an exponential equation equal to 1 plus the rate of growth of decay? Say so you have an equation of this form um, where A is the initial amount and Y is the final amount and x is the unit of time measured usually in years but any unit of time that suits your uh, problem is just fine 
and then B is the growth or decay factor, the growth or decay factor. Now, if we say that the rate of growth, let's call that P, why is it that, why is it that B is equal to 1 plus P, where we will interpret P as positive if it represents growth and negative if it represents decay. Let's look at two uh, examples, one of growth and one of decay. The foundation of your house is about 1,200 termites. The termites grow at a rate of about 2.4% per day. What will the population of termites be in five days? So this is to say y is equal to a, b, to x. Now in this case we know a to be, we know a to be 1,200 and we know x to be 5 in 5 days, and b, well, b will be its growth, so it will be 1 plus 0 0.024. We express this percent in decimal uh, form. So this is just y is equal to 1,200 times 1.024 raised to the fifth power. And whatever number that is, that will be the population of the of termites after five days. Let's consider one of a DK. Uh, you buy a new computer for $2,100. That's uh, the initial amount, $2,100. The computer decreases. It decreases by 45% annually. That's the rate of decrease, the rate of decay. Uh, what will be its value in three years? Well, this will be one minus, because it is decreasing, it's decay, minus 0 0.45. We're measuring time in years now, raised to the third power. In other words, y will be equal to 2,100 times 0 0.55 raised to the third power, whatever number that is, that will be the value of your computer after three years. But what about the general case? If you have an equation, an exponential equation of this form, why is it that the growth factor is equal to 1 plus p, where p is the rate of growth or the rate of decay? Well, one way to look at it is that after one unit of time, say after one, yeah, one year, after one unit of time, after one unit of time, uh, y will be equal to a times b to the first power. But that's just a times b. That is just a times b. And another way of looking at this is after one unit of time, the final population will be a will be a plus plus whatever you had at the beginning times the growth or decay factor which we are calling p we factor out the a we see that this is just one plus p and now combine looking at these two parts of this equation we can see why since a times b equals a times one plus p that B is indeed 1 plus B. Thank you. Let us see how we can solve the equation 2 to the x equals negative x plus 11. This is a nice problem where students can break it, break it down into a system of equations, one of which is exponential and the other one which is linear. So let the left hand side of the equation become y equals 2 to the x and the right hand side of the, uh, right hand side of the equation let it be uh, y equals negative x, I mean, yes, plus 11.
We can do this now on a graph. We will use a graphing method to solve this because at this stage students probably have not been exposed to solving uh, exponential equations. Uh, so they do not know how to work with logarithms and so on. So let us use this, this graphing approach. y equals 2 to the x. And let the second equation be y equals negative x plus uh, 11. So now let us, oh, you see how nice? So we see, we see that the functions intersect and we can touch the point where they intersect and we can see that that is the point 3 8 that is the point of intersection when we go back to the system of equations we can verify that solution uh, the solution uh, was the point was the point 3 8 and you know, x equals 3 y equals uh, 8 now let us see if that is indeed the case what is the value of y when x is 3 well, that is indeed 8. 8 is equal to 8. And what about here? What is the value of y when x is equal to negative 3? Well, we can readily see that also 8 is equal to 8. So you can see that the solution is indeed uh, x equals 3. x is equal to 3, and the function assumes the value of 8. How to add or subtract polynomials. What do you get when you add two cats and three dogs? Let me think. Hmm, five cat dogs? No, right? Because the cats continue to be cats and the dogs continue to be dogs. I mean, you may have five pets, but you still have two cats and three dogs. Now, we can apply this same principle when we add polynomials. Because what property do we use when we add things? Yes, we add things with the same name. Consider this. If Julie has three cats and one dog, and Jeremy has one cat and two dogs, what can you say about their combined number of cats and dogs? Well, let's use C for cats and D for dogs. So Julia, Julia has three cats, let's say three C, and one dog. That's right, 1D. And we want to combine them. So combine means we have to add them. We're going to add the number of pets that Julia has with uh, the dogs and cats that Jeremy has. Um, this he, Jeremy has one cat, so we'll say 1C, and two dogs, plus 2D. Now when we add this, we know that combine, they have four cats, 4C, four and that they have three dogs all together. We are adding things with the same name. Cats with cats, C's with C's, and dogs with dogs, D's with D's. Now, of course, we didn't need to write this one here or here, but we wrote it just for clarification. Now, let's look at subtraction. What if two cats and one dog from their combined number of pets die. What could we say about their combined number of cats and dogs? We have four cats all together, Julia and Jeremy. They have four cats and they have three dogs. And we want to subtract those that will die. So, one, two cats will die and one dog will die. Now, we know that if we had four cats and two dies, we're going to end. We're going to end up with two cats, and then if we had three dogs and one dies, we're going to end up with two dogs. But notice that in order for this to happen, you know, we are subtracting this guy from C and this guy from D. So this is just four C plus three D minus two C 
minus, right? We're distributing that uh, minus sign, minus d. And now we combine like terms, 4c minus 2c plus 3d minus d is equal to uh, 2c plus 2d, which is exactly this. How to multiply two binomials? What is 2x plus 3 times 5x plus 4? It might help us to consider the product 2 plus 3 times 5 plus 4. Obviously, this is just a decomposition of 5 into 2 plus 3, and this is a decomposition of 9 into 5 plus 4, so this is just 5 times 9, which is 45. How can we use that to help us understand how to multiply two binomials. Well, another way of multiplying these numbers, notice that these are also binomials. They're not simplified and they're constants, but they are binomials. Now we multiply, if we multiply 2 times 5, and we add to that 2 times 4, and we add to that 3 times 5 and 3 times 4, we get 10 plus 8 plus 15 plus 12, which is equal to 45. Hum. So let us follow the same steps. This first term times this term, that is equal to 10x squared this term by the second term here, that is 8x, this term by this guy, that is 15x, and this guy by this guy, that is 12. So this is equal to 10x squared plus 23x plus 12. And now we see that the multiplication of two binomials is something that is not so strange after all. It is something that we can do with integers or with any other numbers. It is just a property of numbers. We decompose them and we multiply them in that way. So now it doesn't seem as an arcane method of multiplying these two objects, but as something that is very natural. How to square a binomial. What is 3x plus 5, that binomial, squared? Let us consider first the product 3 plus 5 squared. Yes, this is the same technique we applied to multiply any two binomials. But let us see it again in this context. This is uh, the decompos a decomposition of 8, and that's 8 squared, which is just 64. But we can also see that, by definition, the square of a number is just that number times itself. And we can distribute, like we did in the other video, 3 times 3 plus 3 times 5 plus 5 times 3 plus 5 times 5. And this is just 9 plus 15 plus 15 plus 25, which you can readily see is 64. So let us use that here. When we square this binomial, it's just the binomial times itself, now we distribute the terms. 3 times 
3x times 3x is 9x squared. 3x times 5 is 15x. This times this is 15x. And this times this is 25. We combine like terms and we have that this is 9x squared plus 30x plus 25. Now, some people ask me, why don't you just teach the FOIL method? You know, where you first multiply the the first terms, then the outside terms, and the inside terms, and then the last terms. I said, well, because that only works for one particular case when you're multiplying binomials. You have to memorize it, you're not understanding much, and then Worst of all, you cannot extend it to multiplication of other polynomials. And that's basically why I prefer to teach it this way, through integer decomposition. You see a construction, something that you do understand. You know addition of integers. You know subtraction of integers. And you learn. Thank you. How to multiply any two polynomials. What is the product of that binomial and that trinomial? Let us first consider this product. Now we know that this is 5 and this is 10, so this must be equal to 50. Let us see how this works. So 3 times 4 is 12, 3 times 7 is 21, uh, 3 times negative 1 does minus three, negative 3, so we take away 3, and now we distribute the 2, we first distributed the 3, now we distribute the 2, 2 times 4 is 8, plus 14, minus 2, and this is just 50. This works because it is based on the distributive property. I'm using integer decomposition because it is something that you can easily recognize and easily accept and easily uh, apply to this other problem. So we have this, mo this binomial multiplied by that trinomial. Let us apply the same technique. And this first term will be multiplied by every member of, the, of that trinomial. So this is 12x cubed plus 21x squared minus 3x and then these three other terms plus 8x squared plus 14x minus 2. We combine like terms and we have that this is 12x cubed plus 29x squared plus 11x minus 2. Thank you. Factoring by pulling out the greatest common factor. Do you remember the distributed property? When we played with it in using integer decomposition, it allowed us to distribute. Right? This is a property of numbers. 2 times 3 is 6, plus 2 times 8, 7 times 4, which is 8. This is just 14. But we knew that because this was just 2 times 7, right? This was just 2 times 7, and we knew that that was 14. This is just a property of numbers. We, we can distribute uh, this too. But notice that this 2 is also a factor of both 6 and 8. 2 is a factor. 2 is a common factor. Not only, two is, not only is it 2 a common factor, but 2 is the greatest 
the greatest common factor common factor right that's why we call it the GCF the greatest common factor distributing leads to factoring factoring leads to distributing the inverse processes so here we can distribute this two and this is 6x plus 8 whereas here we can first identify what if any factors uh, those two terms have in common and we see that they have the two in common 2 times 3x plus 2 times 4 we can pull out the 2 we can pull it out and this is just 3x plus 4 which is exactly what we have here so here we are distributing and here we are factoring we just have to be careful because sometimes w the variables we may have variables as common factors we may have constants we may have both so we just have to be careful like here only the B only the only thing that they have in common is B so we have B 5B squared plus 10B minus 1 and if we want to check we want to check our process in which we should especially at the beginning we multiply this times the, the B times the first term this is 5B cubed plus 10B squared minus B let us consider another example in this case what they have in common is a 3 they have a factor in common because this is 3 C square minus 3 times 2 so we can pull out the 3 we can pull out the 3 and we have 6 squared here minus 2 which we can also check like we did in the previous example thank you The difference of two squares. What do you notice in these four products? Well, the first product is x squared minus x plus x minus 1. These two terms collapse and you get x squared minus 1. Here you get x squared minus 2x plus 2x minus 4. Again, the two middle terms collapse and you get x squared minus 4. Here you get x squared minus 3x plus 3x minus 9. The middle terms collapse. This is x squared minus 9. So you expect the same pattern here. You're going to have x squared minus 16. So what is x squared minus 25? Well, it must be, it must factor as x plus 5 times x minus 5 which you can readily verify what about 9x squared minus 4 we have to take the square of this first term let's see it looks like it should be 3x plus the square root of 4 2 times 3x which is the square of the first term minus 2 let us check this is 9x squared minus 6x plus 6x minus 4 they just to collapse yes indeed that is what we were looking for and in general when you have the difference of two squares they 
factor as the square root of the first term a plus the square root of the second term b times the square root of a squared which is a minus the square root of b squared which is b. Factoring some trinomials. After looking at how to factor the difference of two squares, we may wonder what happens when instead of something like x plus 1 times x minus 1, we have x plus 1 times x plus 1. Let's see what happens here. We're multiplying these two terms, but since we don't have that plus a minus term, they're not going to, the middle terms are not going to cancel, so we're just going to end up with x squared plus x plus x, that is plus 2x plus 1 times 1, 1. So we have the square root of this term times, and then the middle term is just times 2. And look at it here, it's just x plus 2 times x plus 2. This is x squared plus 2x plus 2x, right? Plus 2x plus 2x, that's plus 4x, plus 4. And here we have x plus 3 times x plus 3, which is x squared plus 3x plus 3x, that is plus 6x plus 3 times 3, 9. So what can we say about x squared plus 14x plus 49? Well, the square root of 49 is 7, and 7 times 2 is 14. So this must factor as x plus 7 squared. Now in general, what can we infer? If we have a trinomial where the coefficient of the linear term is twice the square root of the constant, then it will just factor as x plus a squared. Now, usually this is not too helpful. People usually don't, and some people do remember this formula, but factoring is not about remembering formulas. It's more about understanding what's happening and with time you do remember some formulas but the emphasis should never be on memorizing formulas but on understanding whatever it is that we're doing. Factoring more trinomials. How do we factor something like this? 6x squared plus 17x plus 12. Now, this is a simpler case in a way because we have only addition. We have no negative numbers here. So that makes it one degree easier or less difficult. Now, in general, this is what we have. Now, that formula looks awfully hard and who would like to memorize that? Again, I don't recommend that you memorize uh, any factorization formula. You will learn some as you move along. It's important that you understand what's happening and that's the only reason why I'm using this formula here. I just want you to remember uh, usually this this middle term, the, the linear coefficient, is the one that throws people off when they're trying to factor a polynomial where the quadratic term is not 1. Let us look at it in a simpler scenario. If the area of a rectangle is given by 6x squared plus 17x plus 12 and the width is 2x plus 3, what is the length in terms of x? 
Now here we are already given the width. There's given that the area is this and that the width is 2x plus 3. So now we want to know what the length is. Well, we were already given one of the factors, so this will make it a lot easier. But in general, you will not have that advantage. So here we need something that when we multiply it by 2 will give us 6. That must be 3, 3x. And then something that when we multiply it by 3 will give us 12. That must be 4. So the length must be 3x plus 4. And how does this formula come into play? Well, notice that we can rewrite this, not that we want to do it, but let's just to illustrate this formula. A times C. Remember, for us, this is A, this is B, this is C, and this is D. So, A times C is 2 times 3x squared plus x times A times D, 2 times 4, which is 8, plus B times C, which is 3 plus 3, 9, 9, and 8 is 17, plus B times D. Perhaps it is convenient to just remember that the linear term will be A times D plus B times C. But if you don't remember it, just use trial and error, and with time, you will get a good sense of what the terms should be. Let us look now at the bottoms up technique, a way to factor trinomials. We discussed in a previous video that when factoring a trinomial where the quadratic coefficient is different from 1, many people just become very proficient at trial and error, intelligent guessing and testing, and they, uh, that is enough for them. But we can also do something that's a bit more systematic. This technique has several steps. The first step is to see whether there is any common factor in the three terms to pull out. That's not the case here. So the second step is to multiply the quadratic coefficient by the constant. 6 times 12 is 72. And now we look at all the factor pairs of 72. 1, 72, 2 times 36, 3 times 24, 4 times 18, 6 times 12, and 8 times 9. And then the third step is to choose a factor pair that adds up to 17. This is the only pair that satisfies that conditions. So now we go to the next step. Take that 8. You, we are going to create two binomials. x, x, x plus 8, and x plus 9. The next step is to divide the constant terms by the quadratic coefficient, in this case, 6. Now, this becomes x plus 4 thirds, and this is x plus 3 halves. If those fractions would have been integers, we would have stopped there. Since they're not, we're going to multiply by a, an integer so that we get rid of that fraction. Let us multiply the first binomial by 3, 3x plus 4, and let us multiply the second binomial by 2, 2x plus 3. Now, we claim that this is the factorization of this trinomial. And in fact, we can check here, 6x squared plus 8x plus 9x plus 12 is indeed what we want it.
Let us look at a second case of the bottoms up technique. In this instance, there is a greatest common factor to pull out. Here we can pull out 3 and we have 4x squared plus 7x minus 2. And now we apply the bottoms up technique that we saw previously to this trinomial. We look at the quadratic coefficient which is 4 and multiply it by the constant that's negative 8. We're going to think about it as 8 and the factor pairs are plus or minus 1 times plus or minus 8 and plus or minus 2 times plus or minus 4. Now the only way to get 7 out of one of those factor pairs is with 1 and 8. 8 minus 1 is 7 so we will begin our factorization with two binomials one with x plus 8 and the other one x minus 1. We will now divide the constant terms in those binomials by the quadratic coefficient which is 4 this becomes x plus 2. Since 2 is an integer, we stop there. We don't do anything else to that binomial. And since here we have 1 fourth, we multiply by 4 so that we get an integer. Now we claim that this is, let us check, 4x squared minus x plus 8x minus 2 which is exactly what we were looking for. Hence the factorization of this trinomial is 3 times x plus 2 times 4x minus 1. Thank you. Factoring by grouping. How do we factor something of this form? Now we see that these first two terms have a in common. The last three terms have 2 in common. The first and third term have a b in common. So let's see. If we group a and b, ab plus 2b, and we also group 2ac plus 4c, now we can pull out a b on here, have a plus 2, and here we can pull out a 2c, and inside we can have a plus 2. Now these two terms have a common factor, namely a plus 2. So we can pull out that common factor, and what's left from the first term is b, and from the second term is 2c. Now let us look at a second example. Well, here I'm going to group these two and these two. I'm going to pull out 2x squared and then an x is left inside plus 1. Then here I'm going to pull out negative 3 and inside we'll end up with x plus 1. Yes, now we have a common factor. A common factor from those terms that we can pull out from the first term, 2x squared remains, and from the second term, 3. Let us clarify some 
confusion between quadratic equations and quadratic functions. These terms are often used interchangeably in high school and middle school, and sometimes that is correct, but in general, the concept of equation is a broader concept than function. Let us review some basic definitions. An equation is a mathematical statement asserting that two expressions are equal. A function is a relation such that each member of the domain is paired to exactly one element of the codomain. A relation is a set of ordered pairs. There are three parts of a function. There are two sets called the domain and the codomain, although most middle school and high school students are familiar with the range. And we have some elements in the domain. We have some elements in the range. We may have elements outside of the range that are part of the codomain also, but we don't consider those cases at this level. And then we have a rule of assignment, let us call it F, that tells us how the elements from the domain are paired to the elements of the codomain. In a sense, we can say that since rules can be expressed as equations, then all functions are equations, but not all equations are functions. In the realm of quadratics, which are polynomials of degree 2, Quadratic equations may have one or more variables. Here are some examples. The general form in one variable is this, where a, b, and c are parameters. They're real numbers. They're called parameters. And these are real numbers such that a is different from zero, because if a were zero, then this term would collapse, and this would be a linear equation, provided, of course, that b is different from zero. And in terms of quadratic functions, they are all quadratic equations. They may have one or more independent variables, and we apply techniques used for solving quadratic equations to help us graph quadratic functions. Let us look at one example. We set this function, this quadratic function, if we set it equal to 0, we can find the x-intercepts, and this is x plus 2 times x minus 2, which tells us that x is negative 2, or x equals 2. These are the x-intercepts of our function. If we evaluate the function at 0, we get the y-intercept. This is the y-intercept. There's only one. Otherwise, we would violate the definition of a function. And these are the x-intercepts, which we already graphed. And then we, gra we plot this point. And since this is a quadratic function, we know that the graph is a parabola that opens upward and here's a sketch of our graph. Completing the square. Addition. Consider the expression x squared plus 6x. We can think geometrically about this as a square of side x and a rectangle of side x and say width x and length 6. Now if we cut this rectangle in half and put one of those strips here, all the dimensions of this strip are 3 times x and we put the other strip here, 3x. We have almost formed a new square, a larger square of dimensions x plus 3. But we need a little piece. We need a little square with dimensions 3 times 3. That is, we need 9 square units. So now, we have made a square with dimensions x plus 3. 
how does this relate to this? Well, x squared plus 6x, when we add 9 square units to it, this is equal to x plus 3 squared. Hmm. So can we use this to solve a quadratic equation? Consider this one. This looks very similar to the previous expression, although now it's an equation and we have this one here. Let us first move that one over to the other side. And we know that we can complete this expression. We can complete the square by adding 9 to it. That is 6 divided by 2 is 3. 3 squared is 9. And since we added that to the left-hand side, we added to the right-hand side of this equation. And we have that x plus 3 squared is equal to 8. If we take the square root on both sides, we get that x plus 3 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 8. That is, x is equal to negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 8 is 2 square root of 2. So we have two values for x. x is negative 3 plus 2 square root of 2. Or x can be negative 3 minus 2 times the square root of 2. And those are the solutions to this quadratic equation, which we have solved by applying the technique called completing the square. Completing the square. Subtraction. Consider the expression x squared minus 8x. We can think about this as a square of side x and a rectangle of, say, length x and width 8. If we cut this rectangle in half so that we have two rectangles of dimensions x by 4, and we place one of them here to take it away. We're taking away this rectangle from this square. And now we place this one here to take away this other rectangle. Oh, we see here that we took away this little piece twice. And that's, that's 4 by 4. So we took away 16 square units from there the first time. And then when we, since we took it away a second time, now we have to add those 16 square units. So this is a new square of dimensions x minus 4. Oh, so this x minus 4, this square... The area of that square is just 8 squared minus 8x plus the 16 term, the 16 square units that we subtracted. Hmm. Can we use that to solve an equation such as this? Yes, and this is the technique called completing the square. That's our first add negative 3 to both sides of this equation to get this. Now we know that we can complete this left hand side by adding 16 units. If we do it to one side, we do it to the other. We know that this factor says x minus 4 squared is equal to 13. If we now take the square roots to both sides of this equation, we get that x minus 4 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 13. That is, x is equal to 4 plus or minus the square root of 13. So we have that 
x is equal to 4 plus the square root of 13 or x is equal to 4 minus the square root of 13 and those are the two solutions to this equation which we solved by applying the technique called completing the square. Thank you. The quadratic formula. Consider the general equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Remember that x is a variable whereas a, b, and c are parameters with a distinct from zero. And remember that all parameters are constants but not all constants are parameters. How do we solve this quadratic equation for x? Let's complete the square. We have this equation. When we complete the square, the first thing we do is we want the quadratic coefficient to be equal to 1. So let us divide by a. We can do this because a is different from 0. So this is this becomes x squared plus b over a times x plus c over a equals 0. We may want to subtract this constant from both sides of the equation. This is x, x squared plus bax equal to negative c over a. Now we know that to complete the square what we do is we divide the linear term by 2 and then square it. So we divide the linear term by 2 and then we square it. If we add it to one side, we must add it to the other. Now this factors as x plus b over 2a square. Now this can also be expressed as, I'll do it now, b squared over 4a squared. Now if we take the square root both sides of this equation, we get that x plus b over 2a is equal to plus or minus the square root of this expression. If we, if we want to have the same denominator, we multiply the first term by 4a, the, both the numerator and the denominator, and we get 4ac plus b squared. We have that x is equal to minus b over 2a plus or minus the square root. We can take the square root of the denominator and then and rearrange these terms here, b squared minus 4ax over the square root of 4a squared. Now we have that x is equal to minus b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4a times c over the square root of 4a squared which is just 2a. Now since we have the same denominator we have that x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a which is the quadratic formula. And now you can solve any quadratic equation. Axiomatic systems.
Every axiomatic system consists of three basic components. Definitions, axioms or postulates, and rules of inference, or the rules of logical reasoning. With these, we construct a body of knowledge by deriving conclusions that we call theorems. Let us look at them more carefully. In terms of definitions, there are some definitions that we call primitive terms. Suppose we want to define the word set. And we say, a set is a group of things. And we say, well, what's a group? A group is a collection of things. And what's a collection? Oh, it's a batch of things. And what's a batch? It's a series of things. And what is a series? Of, it's a set of things. So notice that we are going around in circles at one point or another because the list of words in any vocabulary is finite we are bound to come to one of the words we previously used to define a term. In an axiomatic system, what we do is, to avoid this problem, we take some words as primitive terms. Primitive terms are undefined terms. Now, we don't want to take too many of those. We're just going to take a very few amount of these. That They are so basic that we think that anybody would readily understand what we are talking about without any room whatsoever for a confusion. With those definitions in mind, you create axioms. Now, these axioms are also called postulates. They are, quote-unquote, self-evident truths. Clark also calls them as experimentally verifiable. He says that axioms are experimentally verifiable. Oh, we can think of them as laws. Or we can also think of them as beliefs. So we have some set of beliefs, some set of laws, some, some set of truth, or some set of principles that we take as true. We may argue their validity. But within the system, the assumption is that they are true, that they always hold true. And then we also have rules of inference. These are the rules that govern logical reasoning. For instance, rules for negations, rules for conditionals, rules for conjunctions, rules for disjunctions. There's so many rules in summary. Axiomatic systems have three components, definitions, axioms, and rules of inference. And with those three things, we construct a body of knowledge by deriving conclusions that we call theorems. Thank you. Let us look now at nested definitions. This is just like nested sets. Like the natural numbers are a subset of the integers, uh, which are a subset of the rational numbers, which are a subset of the real numbers. It's better in this Venn diagram. Every natural number is an integer. Every integer is a rational number, and every rational number is a real number. Let us use that nested scheme to define a square. Let us, we need to start somewhere, so let us say that a figure is that which is contained by a boundary. This is very similar to the definition that Euclid gives in his elements. So a polygon is a figure whose boundaries are line segments. A quadrilateral is a polygon with four sides. A parallelogram is a quadrilateral whose opposite sides are parallel. A rectangle is a parallelogram whose interior angles are right. A square is a rectangle whose sides are equal. Hence, we can see that every square is a rectangle, but not every rectangle is a square. Using a vein diagram, this is what we have. 
Every square is a rectangle, every rectangle is a parallelogram, every parallelogram is a quadrilateral, every quadrilateral is a polygon, and every polygon is a figure. Thank you. Let us look at some basic isometries. There are three basic isometries. Translations, also called sliding. Rotations, also called turning around. And reflections, are also called flipping. There are vertical reflections and horizontal reflections. These get a little confusing because a vertical reflection is when you reflect along a horizontal line. So a vertical reflection, you have, say, this picture, and you reflect it along a horizontal line. And we call it a vertical reflection. We're going from here to here. And then if you have a horizontal reflection, these are vertical reflections. Uh, but horizontal reflections, so you reflect along a vertical line. If you have this here, so you reflect along a vertical line, and you get something like that. Let us see how we get from the left picture to the right picture. What I'm going to do is to select the left foot. I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna paste it. And when I paste it, I have it here. And I can do several things. I can rotate it to the left, or I can rotate it to the right, or I can rotate it 180 degrees, or I can do a vertical flip. Oh, notice a vertical flip. A vertical flip does the trick in this particular case. If we put it here, uh, say we put it here, and now we bring another copy, and we do the vertical flip here. We do the vertical flip. Boop. There we go. That's much better, right? Great. So you can play with paint and, and create exams, or if you're a student, you can just play uh, with this and look at what happens when you do those rotations, especially when the shape is irregular, like this, you know, f f uh, like these feet are, like you know, this star heel foot. Oh, very nice uh, symbol in the Tar Heel state of North Carolina. sum of the interior angles of any triangle is 180 degrees. By Euclid's second postulate, we can extend this side indefinitely, and so we can extend this side indefinitely. By Euclid's fifth postulate, there is a line containing this point that is parallel to this side of the triangle. Now, let's call this a, let's call this angle B, and let's call this angle C. We can see that this angle is congruent to this angle. Let's call it B prime. We also see that this angle is congruent to this angle. Let's call it A prime. And this angle is congruent to this angle. Let's call it C prime. Since the sum of A plus B of A, B, and C is 180 degrees, the sum of A prime plus B prime plus C prime 
must also be 180 degrees. Thank you. Let us look at a simple proof of the Pythagorean theorem. That is that in a right triangle the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the legs. Let us make this shape. and We can do this by taking four copies of this triangle and rotating it 90 degrees counterclockwise to get the blue triangle and then the green one and then the orange one. The question is is this new shape a square? First of all, the sides are equal, which is good, and we just have to check whether the interior angles are right. Well, since these are all right triangles, the sum of the other two is 90, must be 90 degrees, and since this green angle here is congruent to this one the sum of this orange angle must be equal to plus this one must be equal to 90 degrees and that applies to every corner of the square now is that yellow shape inside a square well, all we have to check is well we have to check two things that these angles are right and since these are all right triangles this angle must be right and what about the sides yes the sides are the same but what are those dimensions well this length here is a this little piece here is b so this side must be equal to a minus b. So we have a square of side a minus b. Hence the area of the large square must be equal to the area of the four triangles plus the area of the yellow square. Well the area of the large square is c squared. Well the area of each triangle is a times b over 2, we have 4 of those, for, so 4 times a b over 2 is equal to 2ab, and the area of the yellow square, the side is a minus b, so it's a minus b squared. We do a quick computation here. This is equal to a squared minus 2ab plus b squared, and these two terms collapse and we get that c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. Thank you. Let us look at the distance formula. Given two points, p sub 1, p sub 2, the distance between them is given by the following formula. Now let us see how we derive it. If we have two points, p sub 1 and p sub 2, with coordinates x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2, the distance between them can be seen as the hypotenuse of the following triangle. Consider the line y equals y sub 1 and let us stop right below the point x sub 2. Here we draw the line x equals x sub 2 so that this point here is the point x sub 2 y sub 1. Now this here is a right angle, so we have a right triangle. So all we need to do is apply the Pythagorean theorem. 
This side is simply the difference of the y coordinates. And this side, this leg, is simply the difference in the x coordinates. And this is the distance. So applying the Pythagorean theorem, d squared must be equal to the difference of the of the x coordinates squared plus the difference of the y coordinates squared. And we get the formula that we saw at the beginning. Since distance is positive, we only consider the principal square root and we get the following formula also called the distance formula. Let us apply the distance formula to the equation of a circle centered at the origin. First let us remember that a circle is the set of all points, the circumference, equidistant from a point called the center. The distance from the circumference to the center is called the radius. Now let us consider a, an arbitrary point on the circumference and we know that the radius is the distance from the center from, of the circle, in this case the origin, to an arbitrary point in the circum circumference. Let us say that this is an arbitrary point of coordinates x, y. We can simply apply the distance formula this is r, so r is the square root of the distance between this point and the origin, x minus 0 squared plus y minus 0 squared. So this is just the square root of x squared plus y squared. And of course, since the distance is positive, we can also look at it this way. And that is the equation for a circle centered at the origin. Thank you. Let us look at the midpoint formula. Given two points, p sub 1 and p sub 2, given by the coordinates x sub 1, y sub 1, and x sub 2, y sub 2, the distance between them is given by the following formula. Now, let us first look at two examples and then go back to the derivation of this formula. Find the point between 1, 2, and 1, 7. So suppose this is 1 here. So the point 1, 2 would be about here, 1, 2. And then let's say the point 7 is right there. So this is the point 1, 7. 1, 7, 1, 2. Now we know that the midpoint of this line segment must lie here. So the x, co the x coordinate must be 1. But what about the y coordinate? Well, it lies between 2, 1, 7, and this is just the average, the arithmetic mean of 7 and 2. 7 plus 2, 7 plus 2 is 9. 9 over 2 is just 4.5, 4.5. So this would be 4.5. And yes, 2 plus 2.5 lands you there, and 4.5 plus 2.5 lands you at the point 1, 7. So we're right in the middle. We found the midpoint there. Let us look at a second case. Let us fix now the y coordinate. So if we are at the point negative 1, 4, Let's say it is somewhere here, 
if this is negative 1 and this is 4, and the point 5, 4. Let's say 5, 4 is around here, the point 5, 4. So the midpoint of that line segment must lie right in here. So the y coordinate must be y. We fixed it at the beginning. And then what about the x coordinate? Where the x coordinate is just the arithmetic mean, the average of 5 and negative 1. 5 plus negative 1 over 2. That is 4 over 2, which is just 2. So this point must be the point 2, 4. And again, negative 1 plus 3 lands you there. And 2 plus 3 lands you at the point 5, 4. Great. So now let's use this to derive a formula for the general case. If we have two points, say this is p sub 1, this is x sub 1, y sub 1, and then the point p sub 2, which is given by coordinates x sub 2, y sub 2, then how can we find the coordinates of the midpoint? Well, the coordinates of that midpoint is just going to be, look at the x coordinate. It's going, it's going from x sub 1 to x sub 2. It's going from x sub 1 to x sub 2. So this is just the average, the arithmetic mean of those two quantities. And the same applies to y. y is going from y sub 1 to y sub 2. So we just take the arithmetic mean, the average of those two quantities. And that's it. Thank you.